HITCO Mining's special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit in Zurich is brought to you by Vizsla Copper. Things that make you go air. Yeah. This is Paul Harris for Kitco Mining at the Precious Metal Summit in Zurich in Switzerland. Joining me this morning is Grant Williams, publisher of the Things That Make You Go Mmm podcast. Grant, welcome to Kitco. Hi mate, good to see you again. How are you? I am very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very, very well. Always nice to come to Zurich, particularly at this time of year. It's kind of nice and wintry, which is good for someone who lives it's, in the it's Caribbean. It's raining non-stop for three days. Ago. Yeah, I know, but I'm English. We love that. You, know yeah. that. you should be the same. I went running in it. Um, we're on the last day of the Precious Metal Summit here. You've been very sort of active and I've seen you in a lot of the, the different sessions and the keynotes. Uh, what are some of the things that have made you have gone air yeah, over the past couple of days? <laughs> That's a, tr a translation of- No, I, I realize that. I, I, I was studying my German, Swiss German was not good enough, so I, I have not done that. But um, look, it's, uh, this is always a really good conference, right? Jessica and Misha put on a fantastic conference here. And, and for me, look, it's always about the, the attendees and the mood. And, you know, there's a certain degree of kind of, on the one hand, the people who are invested in the mining stocks all feel kind of beaten down and hard done by, which is a, a very common sentiment for anyone that's been invested in that space for any period of time. And on the other hand, there's a tremendous amount of optimism about, um, you know, about what the next year might hold for precious metals prices for the metals themselves. So it's been a strange mix for me. Um, and I think that the, the uh, you know, the optimism ultimately will feed into the stocks because generally if, if the optimists are right and, and the, uh, the world conspires to send precious metals higher, then we both know that that will feed in ultimately to the, to the stock. So I, you know, I, I take a positive spin away from this. It seems to be a relatively recent development. I've been at various other events this year and that optimism wasn't there, but now it is. Well, look, I, for me, I think that the, uh, the lack of optimism was the problem. I think, I think, you know, when people were either worried that gold wasn't going up, which gold bugs always do, right? If it's not going up to the moon, they all get upset about it and wonder why. Um, the reality is, and you know, Ronnie and I have spoken about this, I know you interviewed Ronnie the other day. Uh, that's, that's Ronnie Sturfley. Ronnie Sturfley, yeah. And in, you know, in a period of rising real rates like we've had now, what gold has done is extraordinary. I would never have thought that gold would be knocking on the door of 2000, given what's happened with real rates. Um, so the fact that people think it's, you know, it's kind of gone sideways and it should be going up, you know, I think that's a, a misunderstanding of the, the bigger picture. And I totally understand because people focus so much on the price. And I talk about this all the time. You know, focusing on the price is, is the wrong way to think about it. Um, I think the relative performance, gold is a, is a relative asset, right? It's, it's a, it protects your purchasing power, it's insurance policy, it's all those things that we hear about. So the price isn't necessarily, you know, Mark Farber, who I spoke to yesterday, said this in his speech, he said, look, if, if everything, the price of everything goes down by 50% and gold goes down by 20%, hallelujah, right? Your purchasing power has increased significantly and that's what gold's there to do. So that, you know, the price is not always the most important thing to focus on. Price may not always be the most important thing to focus on, but um, several of the keynotes here, Mark Farber included, Florian Grammis, Julian Brigden, the general consensus seems to be that gold is getting close to breaking out above that $2,000 per ounce and for that ceiling to become a floor and then not looking back. Um, what is your view there? Look, I, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm a long-term holder, long-term owner of gold. I'm not a trader of gold. So whether it breaks through 2000, which is, let's face it, it's an arbitrary number. It, it doesn't mean anything. It's a psychological line in the sand. I think they're right. I think gold will break out, um, if not in the, the remaining part of this year, then next year. Uh, and I think that will be taken incredibly positively and it will bring a lot of money into the space. But again, I think, I think the more time people spend fixating on a line drawn on a chart and a number saying, well, this is so important, it's so important that it gets above 2000. It's just not the real point of this to me personally. So I, I think they're right. I think gold will go higher. I think all the, all the uh, pieces of that puzzle are in place now. All we're waiting for is that first rate cut, which given the numbers this week and the CPI data, probably brought that a little bit closer. Um, but again, you know, gold will, will do what gold always does at the right time. And when it does, given the amount of pent up energy in, in the gold price, the pent up amount of money in the system, gold could go two and a half, three thousand. You know, the two thousand line is, is just a psychological one. Well, let's talk about something that uh, <clears throat> perhaps means a lot more and has a lot more impact on a lot more people. And that is interest rates. You just, you just mentioned them. In your conversation with Mark Farber yesterday, 
when discussing interest rates, you said that the US Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, fully understands the, the, the difficult situation or dire situation he's in, but he's struggling to handle it. What, what did you mean by that? Well, if you go back to um, the Fed minutes when he was a member of the board, he wasn't the chairman, back, I think it was October 2012, and you can, you can dig these out of the record. Powell talks in that meeting about the, the reaction function to monetary policy and that markets will front run the Fed and that what they're doing is setting up uh, markets to believe that they're always going to be there and they're always going to buy bonds and that will send asset prices higher. He gets it, right? He understands exactly what's going on. Now that he's chair of the Fed, obviously he can't say that. And so what I was referring to is the fact that he understands what's happening here. He can't acknowledge that anymore. And he somehow got to actually disavow what he said before and, and play dumb and not talk about the things that he know are the realities and talk about the things that he believes will, will stabilize markets and give them comfort. So it's a tricky position for him to be in. Um, as Mark said, he, he inherited a tricky position. It's getting trickier. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, central bank execution has been uh, on average pretty damn poor. So the chance of him threading what is an increasingly small eye of a needle is minuscule in my opinion. So there will be some kind of failure on the part of the Fed to get something right at some point. And we will once again um, have to bear the fallout. And what that's likely to be is a return to stronger inflation, is higher rates, is all the things that we worry about. Um, and I suspect just about all of those will be universally positive for the gold price. I don't want to sort of belittle anybody's um, expertise or knowledge or what have you, but um, there are very real implications to this for the majority of people in the world. Um, interest rates, high interest rates are hurting a lot of people, people that have debt. Mark Farber sort of kind of made light of that, that higher interest rates only affect people that have debt. Um, and it doesn't necessarily affect people that don't have debt or the people that are rich and can, you know, ride it out or have the assets to ride it out. But uh, the reality is a lot of people in society are hurting from this and the longer it goes on, the more they're going to hurt, the more social discontent will ferment. And, and that is where revolution start or the fabric of society starts breaking apart. How far away are we from that, do you think? Look, it's unknowable, right? It's unknowable. All we know is we're nearer to that than we were this time yesterday, let alone this time last year. Um, but look, I think it's important to, to say, and, and you know, Mark, has a lot of things taken out of context. You know, that's, it's one of the problems of him being so outspoken and, so, and being so happy to say exactly what he thinks, right? You know, we haven't talked about the saving class for a long time. The savings class have been treated abysmally by central banks, right? So it's really the people who have debt that high interest rates affect and the people that need to borrow. Uh, for 10, 15 years, if you've been a saver, if you have done what capitalism is supposed to encourage, which is save the excess from your production, right, and your, and your, and your outgoings, you've been punished for that, right? That's not something you should be punished for. That's, that's prudence. That's looking after your family. Now, suddenly, those people are being rewarded. If you have got savings in the bank, if you haven't taken on a whole lot of debt, things are pretty good, right? Yes, the cost of living is going up, but at least you're finally getting a return on the savings you've worked so hard to put away. So I think, you know, um, this idea that, that uh, we should spend all that time worrying about the poor people who take on a whole lot of debt, there's a, there's a simple solution to this, which is for asset prices to correct, right? At, at my first mortgage was 12%, but I only had to borrow 50,000 pounds, right? If interest rates go back to 8%, what it means is that $4 million house that you so desperately want is only affordable if it's $2 million, because that's the amount of money you can spend each month on your mortgage. That's the change that needs to happen here. Interest rates, having positive interest rates is a, is a good for society. Um, and we've gotten away from that. So I, I, would, I would counter that, that rates should be higher and should stay higher for longer. And asset prices should adjust to, to, to reflect that. So higher rates force people to be more prudent in some ways? Well, it, does, it doesn't force them, but it rewards them for being prudent. You, know, you, you can't force people to be prudent, unfortunately. You know, what, a, what a sad thing that is. But you know, people who have over leveraged themselves don't have a divine right to be protected. If you've over leveraged yourself, by definition, you've taken on too much debt and there should be a price for that. You know, you, you, you shouldn't be able to just borrow an unlimited amount of capital at zero and assume it's going to be that way forever. Let, let's talk about BRICS now, Grant. Um, this BRICS have come up, China, India um, and the other sort of emerging nations. 
have come up several times throughout the conference. Um, you mentioned that China and India, they'll never agree on anything, but they do see uh, their great regional rivals after all with several competing interests, but they all both see the Western world as their common, e common enemy. Um, as these nations increase their geopolitical power and wealth and, and real power, how do you think they will, that will manifest and use itself well, to be, to be fair, Mark said that, not me. I, I want to make sure he gets the credit for saying it, not me. Um, but look, it, it, and I think, I think we, we are, the, the, the state of society at the moment, we're very quick to choose words like enemy. Right? The West is their common enemy. I don't necessarily think that's where we're at just yet. I'm not saying we're not heading in that direction. But I think the, the change here, the shift, is that the East sees themselves as equals to the West and, and, and is demanding equal treatment. And we've had this Pax Americana for you know, 70 odd years, and that has given the West the upper hand in terms of dictating terms to these smaller, uh, less wealthy growing nations. And those nations now feel we deserve an equal seat at the table. We don't want to be pushed around by Western policy. And they've got every right to believe that. And so I think all you're seeing really is you're starting to see the first bit of pushback. The, Saudi, the Saudis maintaining their production cuts despite American pressure to, uh, to, to open the spigots up again is, a, is the first obvious sign of that to many people that ordinarily the Saudis, particularly with the SPR having been drained in the US, would have said, yeah, okay, fine, we're gonna, we're gonna open up production again, we're gonna give you back that million barrels a day. They said no. That's not because the West is necessarily their enemy just yet. It's because they're saying, you know what, let's put our interests first, not yours, and, and higher oil prices are in our interest right now. Interests are diverging. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, um, difficult times. What, is, what would you say is a healthy investment strategy for people at the moment? Pragmatism. You know, um, I, I was at dinner last night and we were talking around the table about the way people saw the world and, and there was a lot of negative concerns around what was going on in the world. And someone said, you know, every time I have this conversation, someone always says to me, well, you know, let's finish on a positive note or what are the positives here? Um, and I find that really interesting because at the end of the day, I understand why people want to be told a positive story, but what we really want is the reality. And the reality is there are an awful lot of negatives in the world right now. And so if you've been invested for the last five, 10, 15 years, if you've just had your money in the market, right, except maybe junior miners, unfortunately, but if you've been in the market, you got rich. You got rich, not because you were clever, but because you rode this tidal wave of liquidity and lower rates. So for me, the insensible investment strategy is how do I stay rich? How do I not give back the money I've been handed on a plate by, by policy and markets? How do, I, how do I not give that back? And so that requires a very different mindset. It's not about which stocks are gonna go up two, uh, two times, which, where's, where are the five baggers, where are the 10 baggers? It's not about that anymore. It's about how are governments likely to redress the balance and, and make a wealth transfer from the haves to the have-nots. What taxes are going to are likely to be increased? Is capital gains gets going to be affected? Do I need to hold my stocks in a different way? Being prepared for a market and a series of governments who are trying to actively take away your money, which is the next phase of this, that's the investment strategy right now, I think. Okay, we're coming to the end of 2023. Um, 2024, just around the corner. What do you expect to see in 2024? And what would you hope to see in 2024? Well, Austria to win the World Cup, obviously. That's, that's a given. That's an absolute given. Um, oh, the European Championships, I should say. Uh, what do I see? Look, I, I see higher gold prices. Um, I do. I see uh, more social unrest. I see the world, and it is the world, heading into a US election cycle where there will be an incredible amount of both uncertainty and vitriol and... I think it will divide the US even further, which doesn't work well for anybody in the world, but I, I see that coming. I see, um, I see increased social tensions in the UK. Uh, I see increased stress in Australia, in the housing markets. Um, similarly in Canada, you know, you're starting to see this already. I see problems in commercial real estate market. And, and you know, I, I won't sit here and say, well, but let's try and come up with a positive because I think people need to understand all the potential things that could go wrong. For 15 years, through the 90s and into the mid 2000s, you didn't need to worry, right? You had, you had every tailwind you could possibly imagine. Um, now it's time to worry, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's um, I remember in, 
in uh, Rocky Three. I don't know if you remember this film. I was, it was the right age for me. I watched it a hundred times. Mr. T. Mr. T. Yeah. And they, right before he's going to fight Rocky, they say, you know, give us your prediction for the fight. And Mr. T says, prediction? And the guy says, yeah, prediction. And he looks at the camera and he goes, pain. And I think that's the reality, right? There is, there is a lot of potential pain out there in the world. So shift your thinking to think about trying to mitigate that and avoid that rather than, hey, Netflix is bound to go up, Apple's bound to go up, the tech seven, AI is gonna be the future. It might well be, but don't take your eye off the money you've made already and how to safeguard it. Dr. Pangloss isn't much of a, an investment advisor, is he? What about David Cameron back in uh, as prime minister? How long we got? How long we got? He's not in as prime minister just yet. Well, He's in as foreign minister, but uh, foreign yeah. secretary. But look, yeah. I think that symptomatic that there are no new ideas. People are running out of ideas. They don't quite know what to do. I think that bringing him back, particularly given his tight ties to Brexit, is just another divisive move that is going to you know push people even further apart. And uh, you know, I I understand why they've done it because he's a quote unquote statesman and he was in the top job and so he does know a lot of people around the world. But for me, it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a terrible mistake in terms of the social fabric. Okay, well, hopefully at some point next year we'll be able to sit down again and uh, chew over this and how things are evolving. Yeah, we will. And at some point there will be lots of things to look forward to, right? I just, I just don't necessarily think it's now. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy our lives, enjoy our day. It's just be careful. Excellent. Well, Grant, thank you very much for joining us today. Always a pleasure, mate. And this is Paul House for Kitco Mining at the Precious Metal Summit in Zurich, Switzerland. And if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe. Kitco Mining's special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit in Zurich is brought to you by Bisla Copper.